Okay. Uh, yeah, so nobody here cross builds their distros. I've disappeared. You just get to hear how I do it. Um, shouldn't take too long, I hope. We can all go back to drinking coffee. So fundamentally, there's three ways of doing this. Uh, ooh, wow, scary. <laughs> um, uh, normal cross, just build it in the same root as the rest of your system. Um, do the same thing again, but do it in a cheroot, um, which is, in practice, the only way to build anything where any of the versions of anything are different from the versions uh, in your main system. Uh, and the scratch box scheme where you don't tell the applications they're cross-building or any of the tools at all. You just do a build and then magically <laughs> shuffle paths around using LD preload behind its back um, <coughs> and use QEMU. Uh, to run native binaries, sorry, non-native binaries during the build. Um, this is very cool and avoids most of the problems. Obviously, it replaces them with another set. But um, uh, compilers is uh, is easy. Just uh, mDebian's been providing cross tool chains for all the Debian architectures for um, eight years now. Uh, they just work pretty well. Uh, the days when you had to go and get a random tarball off the internet, which somebody made once, uh, and then keep using it for five years because it was the only one that worked, uh, are largely passed. Um, <clears throat> those compilers will soon appear in normal Debian. You don't have to get them from mDebian's archive anymore. Um, it hasn't happened before because um, Debian has no way of building things that have cross dependencies. And in order to build a tool chain, you have to depend on the foreign C library, and there was no way to tell an auto builder how to do that until this week. So sometime in the not too distant future, first the ARM compilers will appear, and ultimately a big pile. So we maintain um, compilers that run on all the fast architectures, so um, AMD64, i386, and PowerPC, the ones you're actually likely to have. PowerPC is not really very fast anymore, but um, uh, it was something people wanted to build on. Uh, and targets of all the all the targets people have asked for, basically, um, which is uh, zombie. What's the current list of target architectures in the compiler pool? Didn't we have a, an i386 as well? Um, or, um, no, ia64, that was it. Because people tend not to have one of those, but maybe want to target it. Um, so uh, that just works, really. Uh, the only catch is that because we're not building in the Debian archive, our version of the compiler is sometimes out of date. And because of the way they depend on GCC base and libgcc latest, um, so even libgcc 4.1 will have dependencies on, sorry, gcc 4.1 will have dependencies on libgcc 4.4 something or other. Um, quite a lot of the time, our versions are installable without a bit of force, um, which is annoys people, uh, annoys me, because uh, I tell people it's all beautiful and you should just use our compilers, and then people go, it didn't install. It says it can't install because of this, that, and the other. Uh, once they're in the main archive, I hope that will go away. So, um, what we do, actually I should have brought it with me, but we make this machine that speaks for people who can't. Uh, and basically, uh, it runs Linux, um, <clears throat> on top of which, so a pretty boring base system, uh, on top of which we run our user interface application, uh, and that invokes a proprietary um, text-to-speech synthesizer. So, you know, like many embedded things, it's pretty much a one application device. Um, we have a pile of code for that. Um, and in practice, it works out we've got about 15 packages we need to build out of our code base instead of Debian's. Um, Quite a lot of those are just little config packages, dev packages. There's a GSM. It's got a mobile phone in it, so there's a libgsm library, 
which actually came from OpenMoco. Um, so we have this arrangement. Uh, it just kind of grew, really. But um, So we have our own repository archive. Uh, all the code lives in subversion. Uh, for no particularly good reason, we chose CMake for the build system, mostly because I hate autoconf um, with a passion. I thought anything else has got to be better than that. CMake's probably better than autoconf, but only slightly. Uh, <clears throat> There's one machine responsible for doing the builds, which sends out um, commands to native architecture build these and um, cheroots on i386 and AMD64 machines. Uh, the main reason we do cross-building is because it is much, much faster. Uh, so we can build it on a native ARM box. Um, for a while, we had to do that. Um, but it takes about an hour to build our application. So if you're sitting there developing, going, oh, what happens if I change this? It's really boring waiting a whole hour to find out whether it worked. Um, you know, you spend, you can have eight changes in a day <laughs> if you're uh, trying to fix things, and that's really, really tedious. Um, so cross-building, uh, it's done in about five or six minutes. So that's a major attraction to make it worth the aggravation and pain of keeping it all working. Um, uh, well, one thing I should say, that uh, Repri Pro, if you haven't tried to use it, is great. Uh, and the Repri Pro man is amazing. Uh, you know, I complained about something not working at 5 p.m. one day, having spent all day working out that it definitely didn't work. It was broken. And it was fixed in CVS by 7 p.m. that evening. You know, it took him three hours to go, oh, yeah, it's a bug. Oh, yeah, I found what it was, and I fixed it. That's, if only everyone maintained their packages like that, it really would be marvelous. Um, and we use it for quite a lot of different repositories and, and flavors, and it works pretty well. So for many years, the base distro on this device was familiar. I don't know how many of you remember that. That was done for the handhelds, iPackage uh, devices, ha uh, PDAs. Handhelds.org did it for the iPack PDAs. Um, so it's a very slim distribution. Uh, you know, the whole thing with X is 16 megabytes or something. So it was particularly suited to our previous generation of hardware, which didn't have that much flash. Um, and the thing is, so iPackage, familiar, runs on iPackages, not Debs. Now, iPackages are, in fact, the same as Debs uh, in later revisions. They used to be tarballs instead of R archives. Um, but after a while, they got bored with that and found it was more convenient to make it the same format as Debs, except that they're still slightly different because the control file is called control instead of Debian uh, when you actually unpack it. Um, minor details. So in general, you can usually rename an iPackage to put .deb instead on the end, and it'll just work. Um, but it's a bit more reliable to unpack it and repack it again. So we had this problem that whilst the system was familiar, we had to have iPackages to install, and that has a flat um, repository structure. You know, everything just goes in one directory, and there's an index at the top. It's all dead simple. Uh, whereas Debian has our nice pool repository system with lots of directories and paths. Um, but I wanted to keep a deb repository because that's what the tools do. Repro produces a proper Debian archive, so if we'd use FTP archive, it does the same thing. Um, but it turns out that um, Repro has a, a function to, to do this. So it's actually possible to keep a deb archive under an iPackage archive in sync. Every time you do an upload, both get regenerated uh, automatically which is quite neat. So uh, we name our releases after lakes in the Lake District. Uh, so the last one was goats. Uh, they go in alphabetical order, so that's about the sixth one. Um, and people want me to do unhelpfully, unhelpful things, like... So Familiar is really old. The distribution's about 2003 that we're building on, so it's got ancient versions of the C library in it and generally ancient versions of everything. You can just about build that on Etch, because that's fairly old. Um, the C library's a bit newer, but um, it works well enough. 
Um, but we need to make the transition from ARM to ARMEL, and of course, uh, the ARMEL stuff's quite new. Uh, it didn't appear until GCC 4.1 and a bit when it actually started working properly. So pretty much in practice, you can't build ARMEL on Etch. The tools don't work. Uh, so you have to have Lenny Vintage. So, uh, but the powers that be, so we have these different releases, and basically head is called development, equivalent of unstable in uh, Debian speak. Um, but we can't just build development on uh, a Lenny platform to actually release it. People go, no, 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 we've tested the GOATS version, that's the, the release software, you've got to build that in new world. But you've got to still carry on building it in old world um, for ARM, and we wanted to be able to do both of these things at the same time for a while, um, which is, of course, incredibly tiresome. So now my build system, instead of just going, ah, oh, it's new, I'll build it in the new thing, goes, well, it depends what target architecture um, you want to build it for, which uh, cheroot you want to build it in, which is a rather strange way of looking at things. Uh, and the other problem is that, what well, problem exactly, but if you're sometimes cross-building and sometimes native building, you want to get pretty much the same results out. Uh, you know, and it all needs to be compatible. Um, so those are the things I needed to make work. As far as I could tell, about a year ago, nobody had ever tried using CMake for cross-building in Debian. Uh, the documentation on the CMake site said, this is how you cross-build, and that didn't work. It wasn't right. Um, so maybe some other people did it and didn't write the answers down. Um, but I, I may well have been the first person to do this. So CMake has a fairly sensible system. It's a lot easier to understand than the way Autoconf does this. Uh, basically, if you're cross-building, you just specify a CMake toolchain file which contains all the stuff you want to change whilst cross-building. So you specify a system type and a processor type and a compiler name and um, the root path there is basically the path that, that things will be installed under. And then there's a whole lot of, the stuff they don't tell you about is a whole lot of magic CMake runes that say, and only look in there, don't go and look in the system, the normal directories as well, because you'll get the wrong ones. Um, and if you use package config, which in practice you need to in order to make a CMake file which will both cross build and native build, uh, you need to have magic runes for where the package config libdir should be. But as far as I can tell, that file will work for pretty much any sensibly written CMake build, for anything, as long as you don't do anything too exotic, that is the answer. Um, so uh, one of the things I'm in the process of doing is putting essentially that file for each architecture into dpackage cross so that um, anybody who ever builds anything with CMake will just find it works automatically if you do dpackage build package dash a target architecture. So to make all this work, uh, we have the main server machine which dishes out build requests to machines of the appropriate architecture to build it. So there's a script called build. Uh, I couldn't find a system that did this. Um, there's various build systems, but none of them do cross-building. Uh, apart from OpenSUSE's build thing, which I've recently come across, and I wonder whether, in fact, that's something we should try using. Um, so I wrote my own script, uh, which allows you to do specify a cross if you want one, otherwise you'll get a native build. Uh, so basically, it just says build a package called SL40UI, clean out the old SVN checkout just to make sure you're building from fresh, um, and just do the defaults, which is the development head out of CVS um, on uh, the current development release. Um, if you just say build SL40UI, you'll get a native ARM build. Uh, and if you want to build an old version or a particular version, you specify an SVN branch. Uh, you can specify a target architecture, because the, the default is still ARM. Um, it's about to, at some point, it'll change to ARMEL. Um, and so on. So this is actually quite useful. You can do, you can also specify, so it, it defaults as many things as it can. So uh, it knows that if you're building for ARM uh, from development, you should be doing it in a Lenny cheroot. Um, actually, no, you shouldn't. You should be doing it in an Etch cheroot. 
at the moment. Um, so if you want to actually build it in a lineage root, you can just say release equals linear and go, OK, I'll build it there then. Uh, I don't know how many of you have thought about this, but if the, the whole Debian system is predicated on the sources being in the repository, um, and you build those sources in order to upload the binaries for each architecture. But in most um, operations, uh, the, the code is normally in um, SVN or Git or something, some version control system, and you actually want to build versions of that and then upload them to a repository, which gives you a, a little problem with version numbers because Rep repo will refuse to reload, to upload a package that you've already uploaded once with a given version number. You can't just upload it again. It says, no, your MD5 sums have changed. What are you doing to my database? Um, so you have to have a mechanism to make sure that every time you actually upload a package, you really did change the version number. So in fact, the build script now checks before doing a build, did someone remember to do dch-i to bump the version number? Because there's no point in me doing this build for a quarter of an hour and then discovering that it's exactly the same version as already there and refusing to upload it. So we now put that check right at the beginning and say, you forgot. Um, and there isn't now a, I think I had it on the previous, there's a, there's a test build option which allows me to just go, well, build it anyway, but don't upload it at the end because that's pointless, it won't work. Um, I don't know if other people have come up with other schemes for doing this. It took us quite a long time to work out how that should work. Um, what else? By putting everything in a Debian repository, it does actually make your life quite a lot easier. I guess everybody here already appreciates that. But, um, so we have a tools repository, which is for stuff that's installed on build systems. So the actual build scripts on the host, the build tools client package, which goes on each of the build routes. Um, there's an MSP GCC package for building MSP430 code, uh, and a whole load of random scripts, basically. So anything that you regularly install on developers' machines, um, if you put it in a repository, suddenly everything's available, and with a bit of luck, people are running the same versions. Uh, that's, all of that stuff actually comes out of the version control system like everything else, but once it's in the repository, it's easy to distribute. Uh, and the same goes for people doing testing and actually installing machines in production. You have a particular released uh, suite um, uh, which contains all the stuff that should be being installed on machines at the moment and all the stuff that people should be testing at the moment. Um, and those are, those are all the packages which go on the actual device as opposed to going on your build system. Uh, so we currently maintain about... Well, actually, we keep all the old releases just hanging around in Rep Repro. So every release name that got released is still there. Um, because people go, oh no, we need to be able to rebuild ancient versions of things. I'm not sure they ever will, but uh, <laughs> they, they like it not to disappear. So we have a SID for messing about in, a development for doing today's builds in. Uh, we, we actually found that you really need a pair of releases. Um, so each of these is a suite name in uh, Debian speak. Um, so it's all that's all one rep repo repository, but it contains all those suites. And you need two for each release because you really need one which is actually released packages which somebody should be testing uh, on a device, and the other which is effectively proposed updates for that release, so stuff we just changed today because somebody filed a bug. But in practice, we found it very useful to be able to stage them for a bit. So you might collect two or three packages, you change the user interface and the speech library and a couple of other things before, and the config stuff before going, right, let's migrate. So you do a rep repro pull to migrate those down one release. So for a long time, we managed with just the release, but it annoyed the testers when suddenly somebody fixed something and the version changed. And they went, hang about, I was testing that. Um, so having them paired like that works pretty well. Now, once we get to the, whilst you can, can have, we have multiple architecture builds, so we have the ARM version of something and the i386 version of something, so that you can run the software on your desktop machine. You don't have to run it on the device. We do a GTK build so that you can uh, test it on your machine. 
Um, but it turns out that for the transition from ARM to ARMEL, you actually need two rep repo repositories, one for the old stuff and one for the new stuff, because essentially the old stuff is familiar compatible, even though we build it on Debian, and the new stuff isn't. It's all proper Debian without. So familiar, there's just little differences, like familiar uses libz instead of libz 1G, um, and the version of libgcc is slightly different. Uh, and the these days, the name of the GIF package library has changed. It used to be libungif 4G because of the GIF patent regs, uh, and now we've fixed that because it's gone away. Um, so as I said, RepRepo provides this magic system for synchronizing an iPackage repository with a deb repository. Um, slightly confusingly, it's the log option uh, in your RepRepo config. So as well as logging to a file, it lets you run an arbitrary script for each type of upload. So this basically says, um, log whatever was uploaded to go to stable log, um, but every time there's a deb imported, run the update iPackages script. Um, and so this is actually quite a powerful functionality. You can do pretty much anything with this. So rep repro just runs whatever script you told it to with a dirty great list of parameters telling you whether the, um, it was added, um, which repository it's being uploaded to, what sort of file it is, which section it goes in, what architecture it's for, uh, the package name, the package version number, uh, and then the actual file. And then if you're replacing, so it's not a new upload, it's a replacement upload, you also get the old package and the old package version number. So given all that information, uh, you can write a script, which in our case essentially goes, uh, if you're adding or replacing, you have to make sure you get the right parameter. So nowhere in the rep repo documentation does it explain that there are a different number of parameters passed when you're replacing than when you're adding. That's a secret. Um, uh, very important piece of information, that. Uh, <laughs> so you have to make sure you're operating on the right file path. Uh, because it moves about depending which operation you're undertaking. But once you've worked that out, basically you can dpackage deb dash x uh, and then dpackage deb dash e will unpack your um, Debian archive. There doesn't seem to be a single command for unpack a Debian archive. Am I just stupid or is there really no way to do that? Nobody knows? Seems to me there ought to be. But you can unpack, you know, basically you can unpack the control tarball, or you can unpack the data tarball. You don't appear to be able to unpack both of them. Seems a bit weird. Um, but anyway, so you unpack the two halves separately uh, in the right way, and then you run ipackage build on what you just unpacked. So that basically turns a deb into an ipackage. Um, on the server. What's that about? Ah, uh, yeah, I discovered that debootstrap is a very nice shell coding. If, uh, if you always wondered how to process a set of um, options that um, might or might not contain equals, you know, sometimes they're equals spaced and sometimes they're just uh, option parameter, um, Debootstrap has rather cool code for doing it. So that's where I nicked it all from. Uh, build on the server different to the build attributes. I wonder what I meant to tell you there. Uh, yes, so we have two scripts called build, the one that distributes builds uh, and the one that actually builds it uh, in the Cheroot. Um, one of them probably ought to be called build client or something. So the, the build that runs in all the Cheroots is effectively equivalent to sbuild uh, in the Debian repository. Uh, the thing it understands is cross-building and sbuild doesn't do that yet. I was planning to look and see whether we could basically add this functionality into sbuild so that everybody can do this. Um, so the server script decides from what it was you built it for and where it, the request came from, what architecture it should be built for, uh, works out what root name that implies. So we have a root called um, AMD64H and AMD64Lenny and i386H and i386Lenny. Uh, and then for all the old releases, uh, if you still need to be able to build for an old release, you still need all the tools you used at the time. So there's a AMD64 Goats Etch and so on. So it works out which Cheroot it should be building in. Um, 
and which rep repro repository it should be uploaded to when it's finished. And then basically there's an SSH to the machine in question, to the cheroot in question, and runs the, um, the build script with the same set of options we just used. This is actually very cool. So you can, you can put a cheroot command inside an SSH command, um, and the whole thing magically works. Apart from the fact you need SSH-T, I don't know how many, if you don't do that, it all works beautifully, apart from the bit where you do the upload at the end. Uh, and you know how the um, SCP shows you the files that are being copied, um, and then it kind of prints them out again. That bit never happens if you don't put SSH-T in, which is something to do with connecting terminals to terminals over SSH. Um, it took us years. We had, for about six months, we just knew that it all worked, except for the upload at the end, and you had to press Control-C, and then it would finish off, you know. <laughs> Uh, which was kind of crufty, but um, before we worked out why. So the only problem with all this game is that you need to maintain a lot of cheroots containing the right stuff uh, for all your target builds. Um, and we also discovered that the uh, iPackage script I mentioned reruns, it's a flat architecture, so every single package is in one directory, and it just re-indexes them all, and that actually takes ages. And RepRepo runs it for every single deb you upload. So if your package builds several debs, um, it runs the re-index thing about six times. It takes ages. So we rearrange things so it only does that once for each upload, which saves quite a lot of time. Um, so the client build script checks out the appropriate version of SVN, works out whether it's newer or not than what's already present, and aborts if it's uh, not newer. Uh, then uses apt cross and msource to install the cross dependencies. Now, as I've said elsewhere, this is the bit that's actually slightly broken. You can't have a bare cheroot and just do um, md build, whatever, build depths, and expect to get all the cross dependencies installed. Uh, on Lenny, it falls over because of alternate dependencies. Its dependency resolution isn't as good as apt's. Um, so in practice, you have to pre-install a reasonable portion of uh, what you want to build with. Uh, then you build dpackage build package dash a architecture, it should say there, uh, and then upload the results. Uh, and we can automatically have them go to the correct rep repro repository, even when there's more than one, because it's based on where they were built. So each cheroot has the correct thing encoded. Uh, so to make a new release, uh, you need to make a new SVN branch. You need to change all the change logs names in that so that because where an upload goes to is controlled by the change log name, you know, unstable normally in Debian, um, sometimes proposed updates or something. Um, <clears throat> in order to me be able to rebuild old stuff from a released branch, we change the change log so that it automatically gets uploaded to the correct suite. Um, <clears throat> we make a new rootfs that points at that suite so that when you install it on a system, it automatically gets its packages from the right repository uh, and then install it on the install machines. And that thing I mentioned about having a, a stable and a testing branch for each actual release. Uh, as I said, apt-cross doesn't... So if you were doing this natively, you can use... Um, pbuilder to satisfy your dependencies. So the problem with using apt is that apt only looks in the repository to work out what the dependencies are. It doesn't look at the code you actually wrote. So if it's not in a repository yet, the first time you build something, you have no way of knowing. Whereas pbuilder looks at the actual Debian directory in front of it. Um, and uh, so does mbuild, uh, which is why we use that um, <clears throat> in the cross version. So what we really want is a script as good as people to satisfy depends um, that understands crossness. Um, if you don't keep clearing out your cheroots every time, pbuilder style, then um, you know, if you install the wrong version of something, you accidentally upgrade it to something newer from some other release, uh, that's it. Um, it. It just stays there indefinitely until you notice that you're actually building the wrong version of things now. Um, we discovered that cross-building isn't exactly the same as native building in terms of libgcc linkage. You get libgcc linked in on a cross-build when you didn't on a native build, which matters um, 
because the Edge version is not the same as the familiar version. So a couple of things we found we had to do a native build right at the end before we released, because it works, but you get a little whinge about unsatisfied dependencies. Um, the one thing that the system doesn't do is uh, ensure that if you do a new ARM upload, then an ARMEL upload happens at the same time, or an i386 or an MD64. It doesn't keep the architectures in sync. Somebody has to just ask for a build. Um, it's not automatic, uh, which is the next thing I was planning to add, because that's quite annoying. Um, <clears throat> that could either be done using the Wanna Build database, or Rep Repro has recently gained a, a needs build option, which in theory should do the same thing. So, uh, like I said, I'd like to make it smarter about keeping the uh, architectures in sync. Um, it might be nice to use scratch bots, because that avoids all this pain of having to get cross dependencies installed and working in the same way. Um, and of course, uh, multi-arch is going to make the cross dependencies part entirely different. Um, I'm not quite sure how that's going to work. I think, I guess, you'll need to tell apt-get what architecture you want to install the dependencies for, because there's no way it can tell. Somehow you've got to say, I want the RML libraries or the um, whatever target device, and presumably pbuilder could gain the same functionality. Um, so, that's what we do. It works. I don't know if anyone else has come up with a similar scheme. If they have, apparently they're not in this room. Anybody have? For the Mare project, uh, we are using also the OpenSUSE build service, which is actually very similar to what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, you're using what, sorry? Oh, the CISA the Open the Build the Service. The OPS yeah. thing that uh, we are using in the same uh, we, we, we are using in the same way, uh, and it kind of acts like what you're trying to accomplish. So I would actually recommend you to look a little closer to it and see if it can be abstracted to actually do this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Because the way you're moving, uh, in terms of, for example, wanting to look at Scratchbox, is actually what it does currently. Uh, where it builds on top of uh, send virtual machines and uh, QE MOSI routes and so on. So I think there definitely might be some potential in that because it already handles many of, for example, the build synchronization and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah, I started looking around the web pages trying to work out exactly what it did and didn't do and whether there was anything we needed that was going to be difficult or, you know, if we could add it easily or whatever. So if you've already had a go, you can explain to me how it works and that's probably a good start. Uh, but also the people who are working with the OpenSUSE build service, they are very friendly and very talkative. So if you want to work with them, they are very interested. Okay, yeah, I went to, I went to half a talk at FOSDEM, mm -hmm. and they were saying, please, we'd like to be able to build everybody's everything in the whole world. Just tell us what we need to do. So mm -hmm. I wasn't entirely clear whether you used it remotely yeah, or you, whether we, you installed it locally or whether you could do both. You can do both because right. the, the server part is basically open source, so you can put your, your own instance, but you can also talk to it through a command line client or a web client. Okay. So, yeah, thank you. That's, uh... So do they support only Scratchbox building or um, cross, standard cross-building as well? What they're basically concentrating on is having suit uh, building as such. And then they combine this with uh, QEMO if they have to do cross compiling. Okay. And then on top of that, they might put in uh, a scratchbox like approach, like replacing some parts, like adding a cross compiler, replacing the shell with a native one, and so on. Okay. Any more for any more? We're all bored and want some more coffee. Jolly good. Right.